Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Free Advice Friday. It has, uh, it's been a minute since I was able to do one of these Free Advice Friday live streams, and so looking forward to hanging out, spending a little bit of time with you, answering some of your voiceover business and marketing-related questions. Um, unfortunately, no guest joining on Free Advice Friday today, so you're just going to have to hang out and, and put up with me for a little while, so hopefully that will be okay. But uh, I, I have been dealing with this whatever this this season's version of the cold flu plague uh, and it just won't let go and so I didn't want to schedule anybody for free advice Friday because I wasn't 100% sure if I would actually be able to do it uh, so <clears throat> I'm still congested I still don't feel great but that's okay we're, we're here uh, I'm glad to be back I'm glad to be uh uh, having the opportunity to hang out with you guys. I'm, I'm trying to think, like, when was the last one? I, I know last week I missed because I wasn't feeling well. The week before that was birthday parties. So it's been uh, been a couple of weeks since we were able to, to do one of these things. So uh, here we are live on YouTube, and I'm ready to answer your voiceover business and marketing-related questions for Free Advice Friday. So uh, you know how it works. Fairly straightforward. If you've got a question that you would like to ask, uh, by all means, all you have to do is... Uh, type that question into the uh, comments. If you're going to ask a question, I would just ask that you put a Q beside it when you uh, type your question. That way it stands out to me in the comments, makes it a little bit easier for me to find as I'm, I'm scrolling through. Uh, so looking forward to uh, what you guys want to talk about today. Anything, again, anything business and marketing related. Uh, so don't be shy. Uh, feel free to ask your questions. Welcome, Troy. Welcome, Chief Smith. Welcome, Remington. Heather, great to see you here. It's the weather here. Trees and flowers blooming all week at 67 degrees and today 33. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm in southern Ontario in Canada. Uh, we, had, we had a couple of days this week where it was up to like 15 degrees, which is, you know, probably about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and then, uh, you know, today it's snowing and there's freezing rain and it's like, holy mackerel. But I don't know this. I feel like at this point I should have every stinking possible antibody known to man in my system uh, for as much as I have been sick over the last few months, but whatever, it just, it's, it just keeps coming back for more. So, you know, here we go. I, I had it. Uh, I, I grabbed it at the end of November. I was sick for about two and a half weeks. Uh, I got better just in time for the holidays. Then it came back in January at the beginning of January it was, again, it was about two and a half weeks. Uh, then I started feeling better. And then uh, the weekend that we had the birthday parties here, so the first weekend of February, uh, I started again. And then uh, earlier this week, I felt good for about two or three days. And then yesterday, Wednesday, it started all over again. I was like, for crying out loud. So whatever, whatever, I can still answer questions. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to hang out here and answer questions. Jolene, welcome from California. Hey, Joan, great to have you here. Hello, Lisa. Thank you for, for coming to Free Advice Friday. All right, so let's get to some questions, shall we? First question popping up on the board here from Remington says, how many marketing emails would you recommend sending per day on a five-day work schedule? Okay, this is a really good question, but I think that the answer to this question is going to be dependent a little bit on what your goals are, where you are at in your business, what you are trying to accomplish. Um, my advice for a full-time voice actor who is trying to build a full-time six-figure business is going to be different from my advice for a full-time voice actor who is nearing retirement and just looking to create some supplemental income. And it's going to be different again for somebody who's looking to build a voiceover business because they just need a creative outlet and, and have this gift to do voiceover and they just want to be able to share uh, that gift of voiceover. So uh, you know, the answer is going to be different for, for different people under different circumstances. So uh, I guess the first question to ask then is, you know, what is it that you are trying to accomplish? Now, because I don't want to just give a non-answer, generally speaking, my advice when you are trying to grow a voiceover business, trying to do your own marketing, my advice is that you are sending out at least 10 to 20 emails a day. So again, that's going to vary depending on what your goals are, 
That's going to vary depending on how big of a business you're trying to build. That's going to vary depending on your availability and, and all of those sorts of things. But generally speaking, I would say you got to be sending about 10 to 15 new marketing emails every single day. That's assuming that you're trying to grow a full-time business, that you're trying to build a, a six-figure income. Now, let's say that you are a voice actor who's working full-time, but you already have a six-figure income. So how many emails do you need to send a day? Well, you don't have to send 20 emails a day. The reality is you probably don't have time to send 20 emails a day because of the fact that you are busy recording all day because you've got a six-figure voiceover business at this point. So for you, you're not in growth mode anymore. You're in maintenance mode. So what does that look like? That might look like sending five emails a day. That might look like sending two emails a day. So it all comes back to what you're trying to accomplish. But here's the other thing that I would say. I often get asked, how many marketing emails should I be sent or be sending every day? And sometimes the underlying question that's actually getting asked is, what is the minimum amount of marketing that I can do and still get away with it? My advice is this. If you are growing a voiceover business, if you are not recording, you are marketing. It's that, that simple. If you are not recording, you are marketing. My first couple of years that I was doing this full time, I didn't have a lot of work because I was still trying to build a business at that point. So my schedule was like 90% marketing and 10% recording. And over time, that shifted to 80% marketing and 20% recording. And then it shifted to 70% marketing and 30% recording. And, and now some days it's 80% recording and 20% marketing. So if you are not recording, you should be doing some kind of marketing. Heather says, what's a good way to market myself to production studios? A good way to do that is to reach out and email the production studios. I would love to be able to tell you that there is a much more complicated answer to that, Heather, but the reality is it is that simple. Um, if you've got a commercial demo, then you look for companies that are producing commercials and you reach out and you uh, send an email to them and let, you let them know that you're here, that you're available, that uh, you're, you're open to doing voiceover work. If you have a corporate narration demo, you reach out to companies who are producing corporate videos and, and same thing. You let them know that you're here and available to do voiceover work. Uh, it really is just a matter of, you know, sending an email. Or if you don't want to do email, make a cold call. Or if you don't want to do cold calling, send a connection request to somebody on LinkedIn. Or if you don't want to send a connection request to somebody on LinkedIn, get connected with them through a, a platform like uh, maybe Instagram or TikTok or whatever. So there's a lot of different options that are available to you, but it really is that simple. Uh, just reach out and let them know that you're there. Now, if you want to get into, you know, what do I say in my marketing emails and all of that sort of stuff, that's a different question. Uh, that's where we get, that's where it, uh, it gets a little bit more complicated. And I do offer coaching and, and uh, classes and courses that teach some of those types of things. But when it comes to marketing, it really is just a matter of find the right person, send them an email. So then the next question, of course, is going to be who's the right person. Well, that's going to depend based on uh, where you're reaching out to, what kind of place you're reaching out to. Uh, you know, if you're reaching out to e-learning, it might be that you're looking for an instructional designer. If you're reaching out to commercial production, it might be that you're looking for a creative director. If you're reaching out to corporate video production, it might be looking that you're looking for a video producer or an executive producer. So it, it's going to vary uh, depending on the type of work that you are looking for. But uh, ultimately, it really is that simple. All right, Uncle Roy says, I'm here, but I am driving. Well, stay safe. Pay attention to what's going on on the roads. Uh, Remington says, would you recommend using an LLC as opposed to a sole proprietorship? This is going to vary, and, and I think that there are a lot of different ways that you can get into the weeds on this. So in Canada, as an example, there is no such thing as LLC. So you are either a sole proprietor or you are incorporated, and the process of getting incorporated is a big pain in the butt. Uh, with an LLC, it's a limited liability corporation. Uh, part of the reason why you would set yourself up as an LLC is to protect yourself from a legal standpoint. It protects your assets. Uh, so you know, if somebody decides to sue you, they sue the LLC, they don't sue you individually. Although as a voice actor, when are you going to get sued? I don't know. I've never heard of it happening. Not say that it can't, just saying never heard of it happening. Um, so the other advantage, there, there can potentially be tax advantages to it. And so that's where I would want to be having a conversation with your accountant. Uh, and your accountant is going to let you know whether or not there are any tax advantages to you going LLC versus sole proprietor. But that's going to vary uh, depending on where you live, right? That can vary from state to state. So that might be a better question to ask an accountant. 
Joan says, I'm planning to add a QR code to my business card. Any recommendations for sourcing that code? Google shows many options. None of them are any better than the other, I don't think. Honestly, Joan, I think that you could choose any one of them, uh, create that QR code, get it on your business card. You know, it's funny. A lot of people talk about, uh, you know, QR codes. Oh, that's so 2010 or whatever it was. I still use QR codes. And I see, I actually see more QR codes now than I used to see when QR codes were supposed to be a thing. I can't even tell you uh, how many restaurants you can walk into now and you got to scan a QR code to get access to the menu because now they're being environmentally friendly and they're not printing menus. Um, the reality is it has nothing to do with being environmentally friendly. It just has to do with menus changing, prices changing. And rather than having to print new menus every time, they just update, you know, a website or whatever. And so they, you scan a QR code when you go in to do that. I think having a QR code on a business card still makes sense. I think that there's certainly a place for it. I think that uh, it can it can uh, direct people to specific pages, right? Do you want to send them straight to your main page? Are you sending them to a landing page? Are you sending them them to a voiceover specific page. One of the things that I like with the idea of a QR code is maybe sending them, maybe having a special page that you send them to so that you can tell whether or not your QR code is actually working, right? The only way that they find that page is by scanning a QR code and getting there. So it's something else to think about, but where you actually get the QR code made, I don't think that that really makes a big difference. All right, let's see, where are we going? Annie says, when you follow up on a cold call email where you received a favorable response, what do you say in your message? So generally speaking, Annie, if I get a positive response from somebody to one of my emails, um, at that point, I want to tell them just a little bit more about my services. I want to let them know a little bit more about what I can do for them. So, you know, hey, thank you so much for uh, your consideration. I really look forward to having the opportunity to work with you on a voiceover project one day. You know, just to reiterate, I'm able to do uh, turnaround in, in 24 hours or less, often same day within a few hours. Um, I'm always available for directed sessions if you need me via Skype, Zoom, Source Connect, whatever, Google Meets. Um, you can let them know, uh, that, you know, I'm always happy to submit custom auditions. So if there's ever anything that you need something done for, you know, please reach out and I'm always willing to do that. I'm always willing to provide custom quotes. And so just kind of give them a little bit more about, uh, about you and about the way that it, what it's like to work with you, uh, so that they have a better understanding of that process. I think that that can be something that you can use in a follow-up. And then the other thing that I would do, here's a bonus tip. Um, after you've had that conversation with them, I think that another follow-up email down the road, uh, or, you know, even in that same follow-up could be, um, would you like to have a copy of my demos to keep on file? Because now you have an opportunity to send them an MP3. Uh, I also think that, uh, sending a connection request on LinkedIn becomes a really good follow-up. Hey, Bob, it was so great to connect with you via email, uh, a, a few weeks ago. And, and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to work with you, um, just thought it would be great to include you in my network here on LinkedIn as well, right? And so then LinkedIn becomes uh, a form of a, a follow-up strategy as well. So something else to think about. All right, guys. Well, if you've got a question that you want to ask for Free Advice Friday, again, if you uh, can type your question into the comments and just put a Q beside the question, uh, that way it stands out for me when I am uh, looking to find that question uh, in the chat. Uh, welcome, Christopher. Who else is here? Heather, Annie... Briscoe, Sean, Jen, great to see so many of you guys here. Thank you for joining me for Free Advice Friday. All right, here's another question. Uh, this one from Christopher. Are business cards like Dot or Popple good ideas to implement instead of standard business cards? So you're talking about, I'm assuming these are uh, some of the digital ones. I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with them, uh, but I've seen a couple of them. Uh, I, I've seen one that, so you know how you go, you've got uh, your credit card and you can tap your credit card or you can tap your debit card. I've seen some of these business cards that you can basically tap your business card, right? And it automatically puts the information into somebody's phone. I kind of do like the idea of that. Um, I'm not sure, Christopher, if that's specifically the ones that you're talking about. I haven't heard of those particular names, but I think that's that's what they are. Um, I like the idea of that because otherwise, be honest, how many times have you got a business card and you've brought that business card home, maybe you've been at an event and you've come home with a stack of business cards. And with the greatest of intentions, you sit those stack of business cards down on your desk and, and you have every, every intention of ultimately entering each one of those business cards into your CRM and following up with each one of the individuals that gave you a CRM uh, or, or following up with each one of the individuals that are now in your CRM that gave you a business card, but then you don't actually do it, Right? And those cards sit there on your desk for a month and then you throw them in the trash because now you feel like it's too late. So the idea of 
being able to tap a business card and the person is instantly in my phone, I feel like it removes one of those steps in the process, which should, in theory, make it a little bit easier for me to actually follow through and reach out to the individual. So uh, if that's the kind of business card that you're talking about, Christopher, I think that there's something to be said for that. Now, should you have some backup business cards just in case? Probably not a bad idea, right? There may be people that aren't comfortable with having it go straight into their phone. There may be people who don't still carry a phone. That's entirely possible as well. Uh, you know, maybe they don't have their phone with them at that time. And so I think maybe having some of those other ones as a backup, but then that means maybe you only print 100 of them instead of printing 500 of them, something like that, right? Sean says, hey, Mark, can't wait to see you at VO Atlanta. I am so excited to finally get back to VO Atlanta. I have not been since 2019, and I cannot wait to get back. It is going to be absolutely amazing. All right, let's see. Chief Smith says, what software are you using to create this video? I'm about to be starting a vlog podcast soon on vetrepreneurship. All right, so... Uh, this live stream is happening with Ecamm Live. Um, that is Mac-specific software for live streaming. Um, so that's the software that I'm using for that. The nice thing about Ecamm Live is that I can live stream with it, but I can also do uh, straight recordings with it as well. So I'm able to use it for doing like screen flows, uh, you know, some of my live training events and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm actually, I've been really, really enjoying Ecamm Live since I since I signed up for it. So uh, that's what I'm using for my live streaming is Ecamm Live. Um, for my podcast, which I also have the ability to record video on, uh, I use Riverside.fm. Um, now, the last several months, I've been recording all of my podcast interviews with video but I have not been doing anything with the video versions of those podcasts. Look, I, I'll be honest, I just don't have time. I, I thought it was gonna be a great idea, but I, I don't have time to do it. But Ecamm Live, or sorry, uh, Riverside.fm does give you the ability to record your podcast. You get split track audio, and you also get your video, and you can edit that video, post that video, uh, cut that video down to different sizes to, you know, if you wanted to post something on Instagram reels or post a clip on YouTube shorts or or whatever. Uh, so those are the two primary sources that I'm using for uh, a lot of the video stuff that I'm doing. Ecamm Live for the streaming and uh, Riverside.fm for the uh, podcast or uh, vlog, as it were. Troy says, I'm using GoDaddy to send emails. I'm able to load lists and manage the list there. It's free. Is it worth another email program if this works for now or just wait? I mean, if what you have is currently working for you, then yeah, it doesn't really, there's not really any particular reason for investing in something different. Um, as long as the, the big thing for me, if you're going to be doing mass emailing, from a marketing standpoint, the most important thing for me is the ability to segment your list and if this system that you're using through GoDaddy, and I'm not familiar with it, so I don't know, but if the, the system you're using with GoDaddy right now doesn't give you the ability to do segmentation, that could potentially be a problem. And what I mean by that is from a, from a voiceover marketing standpoint specifically, I have my database segmented uh, for commercial, for corporate, for explainer, for e-learning, right? I've got segments for the different genres that I'm working in. So if I uh, do a new e-learning demo, I can go into my database and I can pull up everybody in my database that are e-learning clients, e-learning prospects, and I can send those e-learning clients or those e-learning prospects a message to let them know about my e-learning demo. I'm not sending my e-learning demo to my commercial clients because they don't care, right? So I want to be able to do segmentation so that the targeted people are getting, so the targeted messages, right? So that would be the one thing that I would be looking for, Troy, is can I do segmentation? I think that's going to be a really big thing. Tom says, I have a profile on LinkedIn that encompasses both my voiceover and my day job. Is it better to have a separate profile for each? This is a really interesting question. So technically speaking, LinkedIn terms of service prevent you from having two separate profiles. Although technically speaking, I believe that all of the social networks prevent you from having multiple profiles. 
according to the terms of service. So just based off of that alone, though, with LinkedIn, I think it's probably not such a good idea to have two separate profiles because there is the possibility that one of them could get shut down or both of them could get shut down. So the question then becomes, which business are you most likely to be using LinkedIn for? So if you have a day job and you have your day job information on LinkedIn, but you're not actively using LinkedIn for your day job, then who cares? Use it for your voiceover business. Put your voiceover business information up there uh, and, and that's fine. I don't think these days that anybody is going to care if you're doing more than one thing because I think a lot of people are doing more than one thing. I think a lot of people have a day job and a side hustle. And so I don't think that's unexpected. I don't think that's going to play against you. And I think that's something that a lot of people are concerned about, that if if I look like I'm doing two jobs, are people going to think I'm as serious or as committed as a voice actor? I honestly don't think that anybody is reading that deeply into your profile. I think what they're more interested in is this guy's a voice actor. Does he sound like the voice I'm hearing in my head for this project? And the answer to that is either yes or no. It is not... Yes, he is, but he has a day job, so we're not going to hire him, right? So I, I would not stress about that. I think there's ways that you can divide up your profile to have a section for your day job, to have a section for your voiceover if you need to do it for both. The only area where it potentially becomes a problem is if you have a day job and you're using LinkedIn for a day job and you don't want your day job to know about your voiceover side hustle. That's where things can get a little bit more into a gray area. That's where it can be a little bit harder to hide. And so that would be the only other question that I would be asking myself is, is that going to be a challenge? Now, uh, I want to mention this since you since we're talking LinkedIn, um, I actually am going to be doing a fully updated version of my Making Money with LinkedIn Masterclass. I, I've been working on it all week. Um, this is going to be fully updated for 2023 to reflect some new changes on the platform, to reflect some things that have taken place on LinkedIn. Uh, so uh, two things of note here. If you have previously purchased Making Money with LinkedIn, my masterclass, you do not need to sign up again. You will get access to the update. I always get asked that question a thousand times, so I want to throw that out there right away. If you have previously purchased, you will get access to the update. Second thing I want to point out, I am teaching this class live on February 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you cannot attend live, you can sign up anyway because you will still get access to the complete video recording. So just because you can't be there live, don't think that it's not going to be worth it. You will get access to the complete video recording. This masterclass is going to be probably about two hours long. Uh, I will try to fit in a Q&A session at the end of the live stream. And then again, everybody's going to get access to the video recording of it. I'm going to walk you through everything you need to know about using LinkedIn. But here's the most important part about all of this. Uh, what I am teaching you is done with a free profile. I do not use any kind of premium LinkedIn membership. I do not have Sales Navigator or anything like that. So everything that I teach you in this Making Money with LinkedIn Masterclass, you will be able to do with a free profile. Uh, you can sign up for it at markscottcoaching.com. Just click on the shop button, uh, markscottcoaching.com. Click on shop and you'll see the course there. Uh, it, it is limited to 50 people uh, for the live stream. Uh, I'm going to teach you how to set up your profile, um, all the different elements of the profile that LinkedIn wants you to have in order for your profile to be considered a complete profile. The more complete your profile is, the better it is for you from an SEO standpoint for getting found in LinkedIn search, et cetera. So we're going to walk through all of that. And then we're going to walk through a lot of strategies for specifically using LinkedIn for finding leads, for building your network, for nurturing uh, relationships, uh, content strategies for posting on LinkedIn, how to get your demos up on your LinkedIn profile, uh, all kinds of good stuff uh, in, in this course. Uh, definitely going to fill up. I think the last time I taught it actually went a little over two hours. So uh, plenty of good information in there. But that is my Making Money with LinkedIn Masterclass. Again, that's coming up live February 28th, 7 p.m. Eastern. And you can sign up for that at markscottcoaching.com. All right, let's see. What else have we got going on here? Again, thank you for coming to Free Advice Friday. If you've got a question that you would like to uh, get answered, uh, by all means, you can type that question into the comments. Just put a cue beside it so that it stands out on my screen. Makes it a little bit easier for me to find as I am scrolling through and, and looking at all of the questions that are being asked and try to keep up with all of the comments that are going on. 
Uh, lots of stuff happening in there. Uh, lots of stuff happening in the comments today. All right, here's a question from Don. Do you market to England, Australia, India, et cetera? If so, how do you make sure you get paid? Do you send a contract? Uh, so I do have clients in England. Uh, I have previously worked with clients in Australia and New Zealand. I have previously worked with clients in India. I have clients in Germany, in Turkey, in Spain, in Dubai, in uh, Jordan. Uh, I've got a lot of clients all over the world. Um, and getting paid has never been an issue uh, for many of them. I, I, I don't have a secret other than don't assume that people are trying to screw you. And, and I think there's this concern that as soon as we move into certain countries that we're automatically going to get screwed. And I, I just don't see it that way. That's never been my experience anyway. And maybe part of the reason why that's never been my experience is because I, I don't go in with a mindset of expecting that I'm, I'm going to get screwed on this. One thing I will say is giving them multiple options to get paid. So for example, uh, some of my clients in the Middle East, they prefer to do Western Union money transfers. And so that's fine. I've made it available for them to be able to do Western Union money transfers. Uh, some of my clients in the UK want to be able to do credit card payments, and I have given them the ability to do credit card payments. So in England, for example, I've set up a page on my website where they can make a credit card payment in uh, Great British Pound. And so they don't have to worry about exchanges or anything like that. I write the invoice in pounds. They pay the invoice in pounds. So I've made it easier for them. I've removed any barriers. Uh, there are other countries and some of my European clients that prefer to have everything done in euros. It's easier for them for tax purposes. Great. No problem. I quote in euros. I invoice in euros. I've created a page on my website where they can go and use a credit card and pay in euros. And then I take care of the exchange and everything on my end. So I, I just... I'm trying to make it easy for them. But outside of that, I, I've never had an issue with a client uh, anywhere. I've never had issues with European or Middle East or anywhere else in the world any different than I've had with clients from the United States, right? There are, there are always going to be certain clients that you're just going to have to work a little bit harder to get paid. That's just the reality. If you do business long enough, uh, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you've got to chase somebody. You're going to find yourself in a situation where you've got to, you know, I've, I've had to get a lawyer involved once or twice. You know, it, it's going to happen if you're in business long enough, but it has nothing to do, in my experience anyway, it has nothing to do with where the client is located. So that's not really something that I stress over. The, the thing I'm paying more attention to when I'm working with international clients are international rates, because as much as we swear by the GVAA rate guide, the GVAA rate guide is a US-based rate guide. It means nothing in most other countries in the world because not every country in the world shares the United States economy. So when I am working internationally, I'm just paying attention to the fact that rates vary internationally. And there are certain countries that I'm not going to market myself in actively because the rates are just lower than what is worth to me if that makes sense. And he says, sad about not being able to create a separate LinkedIn account. I guess I will just dissolve my day job stuff because I never use LinkedIn for that. And again, don't just assume that your day job needs to go. It doesn't need to go. Maybe your day job can have relevance, right? So prime example, uh, earlier today, I did a coaching session with somebody who works as a vet, uh, vet like a veterinarian. And there is relevance there because do veterinarians not use voiceover? Do veterinary clinics not have IVR? Do veterinary clinics not have uh, maybe run commercials for radio or television to promote their services? Are they not maybe creating videos for social media to uh, promote their, their veterinary clinic? Um, is there not e-learning and training that gets done in the veterinary space uh, for vet techs to learn how to use new equipment or training videos or sales videos for new medications or, or things of that nature. And so being a, a veterinarian could open up a niche market for this individual because of that background and that experience that she brings to the table in that space. And so don't assume that 
in order to pursue voiceover, your profile can only be about voiceover because maybe those other things that you've done in your life, maybe those other careers, those other experiences, uh, that uh, th those other educations and trainings that you've got, maybe those things could ultimately leverage themselves into niche markets for voiceover opportunity. So I would say, uh, don't stress over that. I would say, look for ways to use that uh, to create new opportunities and potentially niche markets for yourself. Definitely something to think about. All right, Christopher says, once making the connection with the prospective producer, director, et cetera, how would you then go about filling them out concerning building that relationship for your future work without being too pushy? Uh, generally speaking, I'm going to get one of two responses from people. Either it's going to be a no, or it's going to be a, we love your stuff, we'll keep you in mind. If it's a, we love your stuff and we'll keep you in mind, or you know some variation of that, then at that point, I assume that, that uh, there's a an opportunity to build that relationship. And so I will continue to make contact at this, at that point. If I get the no, the hard no straight up, I'm like, great, perfect, wonderful. That's one less person I have to keep communication with. And so I don't sweat those no's. I don't get upset about those no's. Uh, so that's kind of the way that I look at it. I'm going to post this because why not? If you're all on the fence about his marketing masterclass, do it. Fantastic. Now I just need to implement those principles. Thank you so much for that testimonial. I appreciate it. Uh, again, if you go to uh, markscottcoaching.com, uh, actually, I think it's just markscottcoaching.com forward slash shop, markscottcoaching.com forward slash shop, uh, you will see the Making Money with LinkedIn Masterclass is right there. It's in the, it's, it's the first thing that appears uh, in, the, in the store uh, so that you can go in and, and do that. There it is, markscottcoaching.com forward slash shop uh, if you're interested in checking out that Making Money with LinkedIn Masterclass. It is going to be a good one. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm about two thirds of the way through the creation of it at this point. Uh, so uh, the, and doing working on all of the updates. Mark, you have to have already paid for that specific masterclass and not playbook, right? Yes, if you have specifically paid for making money with LinkedIn in the past, you will get access to the update to making money with LinkedIn. Um, not if you've, if you've bought playbook in the past, that does not get you up access. That's a totally separate course. Uh, so if you have purchased making money with LinkedIn in the past, you will automatically get access to the update. All right, let's see, where are we going? Oh, there is a question from Laura without a queue that was above. Uh oh, I missed a question. Hey, let me scroll back through. I apologize, guys. There's so much happening in the chat right now. I'm trying to keep up. Again, if you, if you do want to uh, post a question. I would just ask if you could just type a Q beside that question. It helps it pop out to me in the chat, just the way things look on my back end here. Uh, okay, there it is. Okay, from Laura. Uh, do you ever push through an audition job when you have the remnants of a cold or do you refrain altogether if you can tell your voice is in 100%? Uh, came in late. Sorry if you already talked about this. It depends on how I sound. I, I'm more concerned with how I sound than how I feel. If I feel like crap, I can suck it up and push through it. If I sound like crap, I can't suck it up and push through that. And so if I sound like crap, if I do sound congested, if my voice is not 100%, if my, you know, I got a sore throat or whatever, I'm not going to push through it because what you have to remember with, uh, always remember that every single audition is somebody else's job. And I don't want to waste anybody's time by submitting a, a, a quasi decent audition. I don't want to make a bad first impression by submitting a quasi decent audition. And so I'm not going to do it. Now, I've had clients reach out to me in the past and say, can you do this thing for me? And if I'm like 90%, I might record it and send it to them and say, what do you think? And if they say it sounds great, then I'm great. If they say, you know what, I can hear it. I'm like, no problem. Give me a day or two. I'll record it again, right? But I've got that relationship with my clients where I can get away with that. I would not do that on a on a blind casting though, like a like a a casting site audition or something like that. All right, let's see where are we going again. If you want to ask a question, that's what I'm here for. It's free advice Friday. Uh, anything business and marketing related, I'm happy to answer questions for you. Uh, if you're going to type your question into the chat, please just put a cue beside it so that it pops out for me on the screen. It makes it easier for me to find. Uh, all right. Chief Smith says, Mark, regarding adding the ability to pay directly on your website, cool feature, by the way, was that foresight or added as you found the need for it? Um, I'll tell you why I ultimately did it. I really was getting fed up with PayPal. 
honestly, that's that was the reason. I was really getting fed up with PayPal. Uh, I don't like the exchange rates that PayPal offers. I think they they tend to give a really crappy exchange rate. And so I wanted to find another solution. And so in doing some research to find out what other options were out there, I found Stripe. And so that was when I started implementing Stripe. And so initially, I just put up one payment page on my website, and it was for clients to pay in US dollars. But as I started working with clients in other countries, and I wanted to get away from PayPal because I didn't like the exchange rates, it was really easy to add additional payment pages and just change the default currency of those additional payment pages. Um, I used a, a uh, an app called, hang on, WP Full Stripe, I believe is the name of it. Uh, WP Full Stripe. Uh, it's a WordPress app. I'm going to put this in the chat. So if your website is built with WordPress, this is a really easy app. This WP Full Stripe is a really easy app to, uh, a really easy, uh, it's a plugin that you can add to your website and it makes integration really easy. Uh, so it may be worth looking into. All right, let's see, where are we going? day job can show off skills that are transferable. Absolutely. Don't hide your day job. Don't hide your past experience. Don't hide your training. You never know how those things could ultimately play into your voiceover business. All right, what's going on? Sorry, guys, I'm looking through the comments. I'm trying to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Jen says, LinkedIn is your digital resume for the job you want, so the headline can lead towards VO, but your experiences are still relevant. Yes, absolutely. One of the things that I would always say when you're writing your headline for LinkedIn, make sure that when you are writing that headline, that you preview how it is going to display in your newsfeed. Um, that's really important because you don't want to write a really long headline that gets cut off in an awkward place in your newsfeed because the headline is what appears in, in your LinkedIn newsfeed. It's what appears right underneath of your name. And that may be the first and only impression that people get of you, at least initially. So you want to write a really good headline that appears. Uh, Chief Smith says, I use Wix for hosting and builder, but sure, I can figure out integrating that. And if you go onto Stripe's website, there is a section of the website on stripe.com that, that speaks to all of the various and assorted ways that you can integrate. I would be shocked if there wasn't some kind of integration for uh, Wix. Wix is too huge for them to just ignore it. So there would have to be, I would think, some kind of integration uh, for them, for people who want to use Wix or, uh, you know, S Squarespace or, or any of those different, uh, different platforms. So check out uh, Stripe and, and look at the, uh, the integrations that are available on Stripe. Um, let me just, uh, I'm going to switch my screen over here for a second. Okay, so you guys can see my LinkedIn right now. I just want to show you what I was talking about. So here's Tom Antonellis appearing at the top of my LinkedIn feed. So I'm a choice voice solution for award-nominated voiceover work, right? That's his headline. So if you click onto his profile, his headline's actually really long, right? This is all the headline. I'm a choice voice solution for award-nominated voiceover work, a sound from Rudite through silly and above noise, voice actor, library agency. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in his headline. But what is appearing here, that's what I see, right? I'm a choice voice solution for award nominated voiceover work. So when you are writing your headline on LinkedIn, you want to make sure that whatever you write looks good in the news feed, right? Verify in the news feed because now like Greg here, art director and designer who pioneers using intentional design. Okay. I know who he is and what he does. That tells me a lot about him. That's a good headline. Now that a headline was obviously longer, 
but that gives me the the biggest part that I need to know. Paul J. Rose, award-winning voice of thousands of stores and offices phone systems. That tells me everything I need to know about the service that Paul offers, right? So just keep that in mind when you are when you're writing your your headline. Uh, that did you guys actually see that? Hopefully you were able to see that. Um, so that's the that's what I'm talking about on the on the headline front is just making sure that whatever appears right underneath of your name. I know that's probably a little bit small on your screen, but uh, that's the best that I could blow it up for for now. But anyway. Hopefully that's helpful. So what else do you guys want to talk about? If you've got questions that you would like to ask for Free Advice Friday, I am here to answer your voiceover business and marketing questions. Uh, don't be shy. If there's a question that you would like to get answered, type your question into the comments and uh, just put a cue beside it so that it pops up on my screen. And hopefully I don't miss it. Just looking through, scrolling back to see. Hopefully, I haven't missed anything. I do think that there is a lot of misunderstandings when it comes to to LinkedIn with what it is and and, and what it isn't. And I just think that uh, a, a lot of voice actors tend to overthink it. But everything that you have done up to this point in your life has potential relevance to your voiceover business. Because all of those things that you have learned, all of those skills that you possess, that network that you have built over the years, right? Who's to say that there's not somebody in that network that could use voiceover? Who's to say there's not somebody that doesn't have a, uh, a small business that could use a phone system? Who's to say there's not somebody who runs a dealership and, and does radio commercials? Who's to say there's not somebody who is looking to create uh, a social media video for their company and could potentially use a voice, right? And so don't just assume that because you've had other jobs in the past that those jobs couldn't potentially lead to voiceover opportunities. John says, when marketing, how many people do you contact every day? John, I, I answered uh, this question or a similar version of this question earlier in the broadcast, but uh, the the easy answer for this is if you are not recording, be marketing. If you are not recording, be marketing. Now, if you're trying to grow a $40,000 a year business, you're not going to have to do as much marketing as if you're trying to grow a $100,000 a year business. But if you are not recording, be marketing. Now, that doesn't specifically mean that you've got to sit in the office for eight hours every day and send emails or sit in the office for eight hours every day and, and make cold calls. But Every time you're on social media, that's a form of marketing. Every time you write a new post, every time you share a new video, every time you do a new Instagram reel, that is all a form of marketing. Every time you submit an audition on an online casting site, that is a form of marketing. Every time that you do send an email, that's a form of marketing. Every time you go to a, an in-person networking event through uh, the local Chamber of Commerce or Small Business Association, that's a form of marketing. And so if you are not recording, just always be looking for ways to be marketing. You just want to get yourself in front of as many people as possible. And the larger that you are hopefully, or the, the larger that you are hoping to grow your business, the more people that you will ultimately need to get yourself in front of. Seems like a good opportunity to mention this. If you guys haven't had a chance to download this yet, uh, you know, we're talking about marketing, talking about video, TikTok and Instagram uh, reels on Instagram and TikTok videos are two of the most popular forms of marketing right now, two of the most popular formats of social media right now. And if you need ideas for what you are going to post on TikTok or what you are going to post on Instagram reels, uh, download this free resource that I've created. You can go to markscottcoaching.com forward slash 20 video ideas, markscottcoaching.com forward slash 20 video ideas. And it's going to give you, surprisingly, 20 video ideas for TikTok and Instagram. And uh, the reality is that some of those ideas are going to be able to carry over into uh, other forms of marketing as well. Once you've got some, some general ideas, you can apply them to things outside of just strictly using them for video. Speaking of leveraging your LinkedIn network, any recommendations on how to reach out like that without sounding salesy and getting blocked by every contact? I think the biggest rule on LinkedIn is making sure that what you have to offer is relevant. 
My pet peeve, and I think the pet peeve for a lot of people on LinkedIn, is when I'm getting marketing messages. So I, I shared an example of this the other day, in fact, where I got multiple marketing messages from somebody who was selling a service for female business coaches. So her whole business was helping female business coaches find leads for female business coaching. And I'm like, first of all, I'm a guy. Second of all, I'm a voice actor. Why do you keep reaching out to me? Another great example. I had somebody reach out to me today. Hey, Mark, I absolutely love the Everyday Vopreneur podcast, and I have got a great guest for you. His name is whatever, and he's going to be able to come on your show and teach your guests how to write a book. And I'm like, I literally wrote back, if you truly loved my podcast, then you would know that my podcast is by a voice actor for voice actors about voice acting. Thank you for reaching out. Unfortunately, your guest is not a good fit for my audience. Those are the things that drive people nuts on LinkedIn. So if you are going to leverage your network, do your best to make sure that the people that you are reaching out to, there's a reasonable expectation that they could benefit from your voiceover services. But I would say also, nobody on LinkedIn wants to be cold sold. And what that means is don't write me your first message saying, I'm a voice actor. Do you have any voiceover work for me? That's where you're going to alienate people on the platform. Now, if you've got connections that are in your network from a past life and you want to reach out and you want to reconnect with those people, uh, that's you can absolutely do that. And the topic of voiceover can come up, you know, just to let them know, hey, by the way, I wanted to let you know I'm, I'm doing voiceover now or whatever. That's fine. But don't just come out of the gate trying to sell voiceover services to people, especially to people who you can't reasonably assume could use your voiceover services, right? Just like people trying to sell me a coaching program for female business coaches. For the love of cheese and rice. Why? Why, why, why? Johnny says, no logo on your wall background. What a missed opportunity. Uh, Johnny, there, there's, there's work that has to be done here. If you look very closely, you can see right there. That's actually a big hole. And right there, there's a big hole. And right there, there's a big hole. And I think if I move my head, oh no, because the chair back's there. I've actually got repair work that I have to do on this wall. There was something else that hung up behind me. When I started doing my YouTube live streaming, I took the thing down that was hanging up behind me. I just need to patch the wall and then make some plans. I don't know though, if this is going to be the permanent location for my YouTube live stream setup, because this wall is actually very close. And so to put something back there, uh, it's literally like, I don't even know if it's two feet behind me. And so it might look weird from a depth perspective, uh, which is why I'm still debating whether or not this is going to be the permanent place for my, my YouTube live stream. But yes, you're right. I have talked extensively about getting some kind of VOpreneur sticker or poster print or something like that made that I could, that I could hang up behind me and, and get something. Maybe if I do that, then I won't have to patch this beautiful hole on the wall because I can just hang the VOpreneur logo uh, right over top of it. Uh, and, and then who cares if there's a hole there because nobody can see it anyway. If you just got your website and you contact clients for the first time, do you think you need a long introduction in your email since everything else will be on your website? What do you suggest doing? I suggest writing a very short email. Uh, I don't think that, okay, I, I throw the question back to you. If a complete stranger reaches out to you to sell you a service, somebody you've never had any communication with whatsoever, if a complete stranger reaches out to you and writes you a really, really lengthy email to tell you all about that service, what are the odds that you're actually going to read that email? I'm going to guess that the odds are somewhere between slim and none. And so when it comes to writing marketing emails, part of what I'm thinking about is my own reaction and response to the marketing emails that I receive. What marketing emails do I receive that make me go, I want to find out more about that. 
And what marketing emails do I receive that make me go eh, spam, right? And then I start to look at, okay, what is the content that makes me say, yes, I wanna know more. What is the content that makes me say, no, thank you. One of the biggest turnoffs for me is really long, drawn out, stinking emails. And so you are absolutely right in saying a lot of the information is on my website. They can get that information off the website. So that gives you the ability to keep your email shorter. I have always said that when it comes to an introductory marketing email, my primary objective is to get them to my website to listen to my demos. And I feel like if I can get them to my website to listen to my demos, then my demos are gonna do the selling for me. That's always been my theory. So you are on point in thinking that a lot of the information that they need is on your website. So let's get them to the website so that they can read that information, listen to your demos, let your demos do the selling. So keep your emails short and sweet. All right, let's see, where else are we going? Do you have any advice on finding the perfect mic? I have an AT2020, but I'm thinking of an upgrade, but totally overwhelmed with my options. Uh, okay, Alexandra, this, here's, here's what I would say. The last thing that you wanna do is post that question in a Facebook group of voice actors. Because what is going to happen is nobody's going to actually read your question of what is the perfect mic for me? What they are going to do is they are going to respond and say, I have this mic, I have this mic, I have this mic, I love this mic, I use this mic and I love it very much. I use this mic and it sounds great. And so you're gonna have 100 different voice actors that are gonna respond to you telling you about 60 different microphones because you know some of them are gonna use the same 416, some of them are gonna use the same 102, some of them are gonna use the same U87 or whatever. So I think there's two different things that I would suggest to you, Alexandra. Uh, number one would be reaching out to somebody like Uncle Roy who is in the broadcast right now um, and he could probably guide you to some microphones that you might wanna consider based on what you sound like, you know, what your voice is, the room that you are recording in because the space that you are recording in makes a big difference. And so I think that that would be one of the things that I would suggest is contacting, go straight to an expert, right? Don't ask in a voiceover group, go straight to an expert. The other thing that you may be able to do, uh, depending on where you live, if there's a place that has pro audio gear where you live, you may be able to go in and rent a couple of different microphones, even for a day. Eh, it might cost you a hundred bucks but you can rent those microphones, bring them back to your space, record yourself in your space on each one of those microphones and decide, oh, I think this one sounds best or, oh, I like the sound of that one or whatever. And so I think that's something else that I would consider, but absolutely having a conversation with somebody like Uncle Roy, who again, he's he's in the chat right now, he's watching this live stream. He is my studio guru. Uh, he is the one that I consult before I buy equipment. Uh, he's the one that set up my studio for me. Um, I, I think going straight to an expert like Roy, uh, George Whittem, Jordan Reynolds, Dan Friedman, Dan Leonard, right? Th these are people who can definitely guide you to what would be the best mic for you as opposed to a whole bunch of other voice actors telling you this is the microphone that I use. By the way, this is a Rode Procaster. I don't recommend this for voiceover. That's my advice on which microphone is the right microphone for you. But it is tricky because different mics play differently with different voices, right? So that's where I think that having a conversation with an expert can certainly help to make that a little bit easier. All right, again, welcome to Free Advice Friday. If you've got a question that you would like to ask, I've got a few more minutes that I can stick around here. Uh, you can type a question into the comments, just put a Q beside that question. And uh, I will certainly be keeping an eye out for those questions to pop up in the chat. Uh, happy to answer any questions for you. Uh, again, one more reminder from my Making Money with LinkedIn Masterclass, which is coming up on the 28th of February. I will be teaching live at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you can't attend live, you can still sign up for that masterclass uh, because you will get access to a complete video recording of that masterclass. Uh, so you don't have to worry that you are going to miss it. Um, so feel free to 
sign up for that one, Making Money with LinkedIn. Uh, again, the details are at markscottcoaching.com. Uh, you go actually markscottcoaching.com forward slash shop, markscottcoaching.com forward slash shop. And you'll be able to see the link there for making money with LinkedIn. Oh, there's the link right there, markscottcoaching.com forward slash shop. All right, let's see what else is going on here. Now I got all this stuff popping up on my screen. Woo. All right, let's see. Anybody else got any other questions? Any chair recommendations for sitting in for those long hours of editing? You know what? I'm cheap. Let me just, I, I'm cheap. I could say frugal. It sounds a little bit more diplomatic, but the reality is I'm cheap, right? So I'm, I definitely, when it comes, look, I'm not afraid to spend money on my business, but there are certain things that I have a really hard time justifying spending a lot of money on. Uh, I definitely spent some money on my chair. I, this, this office chair that I'm in right now, like this thing was like a $400 chair. Uh, I sit in it all stinking day. And so I definitely invested a little bit of money in my chair. Uh, I have a stool in my booth. Uh, it's a very, very comfortable stool that I also spent a, a few hundred dollars on. Um, so one thing that I would say is if you are somebody who does a lot of recording, particularly if you do a lot of long form recording, one place that you do not want to go cheap on is your chair. So I think I'm also a guy who buys a lot of stuff off of the internet, but I would not buy a chair off of the internet. I have to sit in a chair. I can't even tell you how many times I went to Staples. Um, I don't know if you, do you, do you have Staples in the state. You have Office Depot. I think it's the equivalent. But anyway, uh, I, I went in and I sat in so many chairs and test drove so many chairs. Um, they must have wondered what I was doing. At one point, I was in the, the Staples in, in the town next to me. And I had actually rearranged the entire chair, office chair department, like legitimately. I'd been in there for like two hours. I rearranged the whole chair department so that I could put, after I had narrowed down the, like the five chairs that I liked the most, I rearranged the place so that I had all five of them so that I could sit in this one and sit in that one and sit in this one and then go back to this one and go back with, you know, but do it really quickly without having to like walk across the store because I didn't want to forget what it felt like to sit in this one first. Like it was crazy, but that's the process that I went through in order to buy a chair. So can I tell you specifically what chair to get? Uh, nope, can't tell you specifically what chair to get. All I could tell you is I think you got to sit in it first. I would be very leery about buying one on the internet and uh, don't go cheap on your chair because you will spend a lot of time in your chair. Chief says, are you on TikTok? I did sign up for TikTok last year. Um, I played around with it a little bit in the fall uh, and then I got sick uh, you know, I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, I've been sick a lot. Uh, December, January has not, these have not been kind months to me. I have not posted anything on TikTok uh, since the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas because I just have felt lousy and, and haven't had the time to do it. Uh, I haven't decided if I'm going to stay on TikTok though. Uh, I'm just not sure that it's the right platform for me. Uh, and, and I think I might focus my efforts more towards YouTube and taking some of that content that I was creating for TikTok and actually just using it as YouTube shorts. But that's strictly a, a personal decision based on my marketing efforts and my available time as well. Um, that being said, I can't help but wonder whether or not TikTok will continue to exist a year from now. There does seem to be a growing push to get TikTok shut down in the United States. And it is being discussed more and more and more in government, and I'm not interested in turning this into a political discussion. But I have been following what has been going on in the news, and I know that there's a lot of talk about it, which is one of the other reasons why I've debated how much time I actually want to devote to it, because if it ends up not being here in a year anyway, would I not have been better off spending that year devoting my attention and my marketing efforts towards a platform like Instagram or YouTube, which is much more likely to continue to survive in the United States. So just one other thing to think of. A visual of me test drive. Like, I'm not kidding. I rearranged 
the office furniture department. I put it all back when I was done, just to be clear. I did not make a mess. Everything went back exactly where it was supposed to be, but I absolutely rearranged the, the office chair department uh, when, when I was trying to figure out which one I liked. The real question is, did he test their wheeling capabilities? Uh, yes. Yes, I did. I absolutely did. Not anything too crazy, but there was definitely some push-offs to see how freely the chair moved. Not going to lie. My background is in intelligence, and I'm with you on the unease of devoting more time to TikTok. Like, look, I, again, I don't want to turn it into a political discussion. I just see what's going on. And I see that there are particularly Republican lawmakers who seem to be putting a growing push on trying to get it shut down because they seem to think that China's using it for spying. Whether they are or aren't, I don't know. Not interested in discussing it. I think that this whole balloon situation has probably amplified it even further. And so it just is one of those questions where if there's even a... If there's even a 40% probability that TikTok gets shut down within a year, do I really want to spend the next 12 months building up a platform if it's not going to be there anymore? I don't. And so I would rather devote my efforts to someplace where I think the platform is going to continue to exist. Instagram gives me that confidence. I don't think Instagram is going away. YouTube gives me that confidence. I don't think that one's going away. Uh, so, you know, those are the, those are the places where for now, those are the places where I'm going to continue to, uh, devote my efforts. I think that's kind of what my plan is going to be. Um, I just see a question here. Randy says, just got to log on. What is your earpiece? Randy, I am uh, putting it in the chat as we speak. It's actually, uh, I actually have two. It's in-ear monitors. Uh, I only wear one most of the time. But uh, yeah, in-ear monitors, is, it's just nice for uh, when I'm doing Zoom meetings or live streams or whatever. Uh, that way it mutes my studio monitor so I'm not getting any kind of feedback or anything. It's particularly nice for Zoom meetings, but I don't have to wear like big bulky headphones or whatever. So I just got a nice little set of inner monitors, got them on Amazon, didn't, you know, paid uh, 50 bucks for them or something like they weren't crazy expensive, but uh, they work fantastic and uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with them. So, all right, everyone, I got to wrap this one up. I've got uh, some stuff to do, some places to go, some people to see, some uh, LinkedIn courses to create. Again, check it out. February 28th, 7 o'clock Eastern, Making Money with LinkedIn. Fully updated for 2023, a two-hour masterclass that is going to teach you everything that I know about using LinkedIn. And it is my go-to social media platform. Uh, it is also the platform where some of my most lucrative clients have come from. Uh, I've got some some really like clients that I've make that I make consistently make five figures a year off of uh, coming from uh, LinkedIn. So check it out if you're interested. If you can't attend live, you can still sign up anyway because you will get access to the complete video recording. Uh, so don't worry about that. There's the website. It's markscottcoaching.com forward slash shop. Uh, the Making Money with LinkedIn Masterclass is the first uh, thing that appears in the list there. Uh, would love to be able to see you on the 28th. Um, I do have Free Advice Friday in my calendar for next Friday. So provided that I am feeling well, uh, hopefully I will be back and uh, maybe even trying to find a guest again so we can get back into the routine of this a little bit more. Uh, whatever you decide to do this weekend, have fun, stay safe as always, and of course, go find some leads.